Well, hello everyone. This is Data Driven Chat, and today I'm very excited because finally I have someone who is not the same age as I am, or <laughs> even done <laughs> so, so much uh, uh, sort of data data science work uh, that you know kind of makes it makes people worry. Uh, so we have today two uh, young up and coming stars of. Uh, internet blogging and podcasting from questioning behavior. So we have Merle Van, Van den Acker, who is a PhD student in behavioral science at the University of Warwick, uh, Warwick Business School. And then we also have uh, Sarah Bowen, who is uh, a PhD student in uh, behavioral economics, if I'm correct. Is that correct? Did I get it right? That is, yeah, mm -hmm. that's, that's correct. That's correct. Very good. So yeah, I mean, I'm just excited because you guys are different generations. So that's why I'm so excited. <laughs> Normally, I get to talk to, I get to talk to professors and behavioral scientists, and a lot of them are like, yeah, I had several people who were younger than me, but yeah, I mean, so today is, <laughs> is special. So thanks a lot for talking to me for finding the time. I know you both are very busy. <laughs> Oh, yeah, welcome. see, this this is interesting because I feel like if you say this to someone with an established career, being like, thanks for finding the time, I know you're busy, this carries much more weight than saying this to a 25-year-old. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, yes. um, yeah, so good to have you with us. So normally mm. a data-driven chat, we talk about career choices and uh, we also <laughs> talk about data mm -hmm. and we talk mm -hmm. a little bit about coding and we talk uh, a lot about analytics. Um, but uh, yeah, today I basically wanted to talk to you about uh, behavioral science and data science and data, uh, you know, mm -hmm. whatever data means. Uh, but, but before, um, yeah, before we go there, the first question I want to ask you is, uh, can you tell our audience about your career to date? Uh, how, why did you decide to do a PhD? And uh, what are your projects about? Uh, who wants to start? <laughs> Sarah, go mind. for I, it. Sarah, yeah, it's gonna go be, ahead. It's going to be very short because, you know, we're very young and inexperienced. <laughs> yep. but, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so, I mean, a classic story of, you know, doing economics at undergrad, wanting to do behavioral economics, but there never being a course. So you do a master's because you don't know enough. And then why not just apply to a, a PhD and see what happens? Not really expecting to get in or get funding. And so when the letter came through and said, yes, you've got funding to do it, that was the oh shit moment. Now I have to do four years of PhD. Um, but it, yeah, no, so far it's been really um yeah intellectually challenging and difficult but i think i think worth it and i, I that's how i met mala so uh through the phd we're on the the same funding together so uh, yeah i i can recall this the story of when i when i met mala but um <laughs> yeah, it's, <laughs> it's st stuck in my memory but uh and well in terms of of research i'm sort of looking at uh sort of human behavior but also from like an experimental economist point of view as well so i'm you know interested in designing experiments in the lab and surveys in the field and if you would have asked me this question about my research before covid19 i would have said i'm working on a really big field experiment in rct in public health applications but uh yeah now <laughs> the dream has been dashed a little bit so uh mm. focusing more on um medication adherence uh, as the behavior, but uh, using methods that are more COVID-19 friendly, such as online surveys uh, and uh, behavioral insights and mechanisms and all, all that good stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we, we will come back to COVID-19 uh, sort of uh, <laughs> circumstances. Uh, uh, before we do that, Merle, can you tell us about your PhD project and why did you decide to do a PhD? Yeah, sure. No issue at all. So my story is, I suppose, a bit less idyllic than Sarah's. When I came to the UK, I came to do my master's in behavioral and economic science. And Warwick has this massive drive towards throwing career fairs at you from like the day that you get there, which is essentially like week minus one or week zero. So you haven't even started your program yet, but you should be applying for jobs already, which is exactly what I did because I had no clue that this wasn't to some extent not completely normal. Uh, this is what you get if you go to a foreign country for the first time. God knows what is normal and what is 
consultant um, ended up applying to most of the big consultancy firms had the assessment centers, the interviews, the whole shenanigans, and I actually absolutely hated it. Uh, I had no vibe with that whatsoever. So by this stage, we're in like November of like my first term as a master's student. And I ended up um, talking to uh, Neil, who actually uh, taught me R or how to work in R. And I was like, I don't know what I'm doing. And I'm supposed to hold a job now. And like, listen, I'm, I'm, two mo- I'm two months into this master's. I'm already like, oh God, I should have a job by now, um, which was peculiar. And he was like, well, what do you actually like doing? What do you find interesting? So essentially what I described to him sounded like a PhD because I'm interested in figuring out why people make certain types of decisions, especially when it comes to personal finance. Um, so we ended up, uh, he ended up telling me, why don't you just apply for a PhD? Um, if this is actually something you want to do, I'll help you with it, I'll supervise you. And that's how I rolled to a PhD. Mm-hmm. And Neil then moved to the Warwick Business School and I moved with Neil. And there I also picked up my second supervisor. And um, within the UK specifically, what was happening, because I was there uh, in 2016, was, was when I did the master's, is that uh, contactless payments became increasingly more popular. And there is a very, very wide literature on credit card payments and how a credit card makes you absolutely terrible, terrible at making any type of uh, financial decision. Um, but very little is known about any other type of payment methods. So that's how I rolled into studying contactless payment methods, which has now rolled over into just studying uh, payments in general, mobile payments. Um, and I'm swiftly moving on to moving and looking into financial well-being as a topic of interest as well. So that's me, essentially. Okay, cool. So I just want to explain to the audience that by Neil, you mean Neil Neil Stewart. (laughs) If you don't know who that is, guys, you need to Google him. Uh, So that's uh, Merle's supervisor. Um, So yeah. Um, I guess, uh, so you guys have, well, uh, you guys have very well known in behavioral, for two behavioral scientists, you have a very well known um, podcast, which is called Question and Behavior, where you um, kind of discuss very frankly, uh, all the issues around <laughs> PhD and supervisors, and actually would like to recommend everyone who is considering uh, you know, applying for PhD in general to listen to that podcast because you go kind of through the entire journey of a PhD student and all the frustrations <laughs> along the way. Uh-huh. And uh, Merle has another, you know, also has a blog that is called Money on the Mind where she writes, I think annually you write, right, about, uh, or is it semi-annually that you write a, no, no, an article so about I, PhD? Like, yeah. <laughs> so I, I've written quite a few about, you know, the PhD experience when and, and that's quite irregular as in when I feel like something interesting has happened or when I've come across something where I'm just like, oh, this is not something they tell you before you start a PhD. It should probably be good to push this out. Um, but yeah, I've, I've reviewed all of my uh, PhD years annually as well. Uh, and I will definitely do that with regards to my final year. I think that will be a very long article. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, actually, you know, when for my undergrad, I studied international relations and uh, you study a lot of diplomacy subjects. And in diplomacy, I think there are a lot of these unwritten rules <laughs> that you're supposed to know, but kind of nobody teaches you. So like when, when you actually go to an embassy and uh, interact with the diplomats, you learn a lot about it and you do not learn so much in, you know, in, in the, you know, when you have lectures and, uh, and mm-hmm. all. So, um, so yeah, essentially I think PhD is something like that. <laughs> there are a lot of mm-hmm. <laughs> unwritten rules. Uh, I don't yeah. know if you feel that way, but generally I think... 100%. Uh, <laughs> generally the question that I wanted to ask, and I know that you uh, answer it in, in, in your podcast, but can you explain to people what is the difference between, or is there any difference between PhD in behavioral science and PhD in behavioral economics? <laughs> Mm. Oh, I can see Sarah's face. So <laughs> the issue with this is that I'm a stickler for definitions. I really, really <laughs> am. But not everyone agrees with a definition. So to me, if you are a behavioral scientist, that can mean quite a wide variety of things. It just means you have an interest and to some regards a training in a scientific application of the study of human behavior. To me, that can be a behavioral economist, but can also be a marketeer, someone with a psychology background. Some people come from anthropology. Um, As long as there's a scientific way of studying a behavioral 
phenomenon that is all completely fine to me. A behavioral economist, I think, is a much more specific type creature who comes yeah. from an economics background. And the reason that I hammer on this definition so much is that if you come from an economics background is that you've got quite a, I wouldn't, I mean, I would say quite specific and different skill set because of how Careful. the way economists are trained. I'm not, no, because you're trained differently. Like, <laughs> you know, joking. stata yeah. there, there is a certain type of um, fundament that you come from that I don't think is that evident in any of the other behavioral science um, backgrounds, if you will. Um, but yeah, a behavioral economist is an economist that deviates from the standard uh, e economic axioms and then looks mm -hmm. towards behavior, to me at least. Yeah. So uh, yeah, the PhD I mean, would be slightly different. So that was Merlin, yeah. now Sarah. Remember <laughs> yeah, that now, we are now on the opposing podcast. view, no. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, remember but, that we are on the podcast, so I will tell people who you are, just in case. Just in case you can't tell the difference between the British accent and uh, other, oh, types yeah. of, <laughs> other types of accents that uh, people on this podcast re podcast represent. Uh -huh. yeah. Go we ahead, have, we Sarah, have spent too much time together. We've we've spent too much time together, so our accents may be merging at some point. But no, I hope you can tell the difference. Not um, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, the way I think about it is that you know between a behavioral scientist and a behavioral economist, you sort of changing one word. You could, in theory, have like a behavioral marketer or behavioral psychologist, but what's the point in saying behavioral psychologist if you're already, by definition, looking at human behavior? So I think that the term behavioral economist is useful within the discipline of economics itself um, as to sort of separate yourself, like fundamentally, from a lot of the mainstream schools of economic thought. But so, so definition wise, you know, maybe it's because many of the, I guess, prominent people at the sort of beginning or the foundations of the field academically sort of looking at behavioral science, were looking at, looking at it from a sort of an economist's perspective or sort of, you know, uh, creating experiments or, you know, uh, creating models of human behavior from a very, um, you know, economic viewpoint. So I think that's why it's become a, a popular uh, moniker, so to speak. But I, I mean, there are some really key differences, I think, between how behavioral economists and psychologists would approach designing an experiment, which, you know, you get taught as a behavioral economist. I'm not sure whether you get taught as a psychologist that there are differences. I know, Mela, did yeah. you get taught about these differences? Yeah. So, I mean, the, the, the big one is about deception. Mm -hmm. So as a behavioral economist, you are not allowed to deceive uh, participants in your experiments. So if mm -hmm. you tell them they're playing with robots, then they have to be playing with robots. Yeah. So there's this whole like philosophy about, you know, trust in participants. And in, in a sense, it is bled into the discussion about the replication crisis, because that that's one of the main differences in, you know, uh, psychology maybe you can design an experiment and just tell participants whatever you want, whether it's true or not. In economics, it has to be true and you have to demonstrate that it's true. So it's, I think it's easier to replicate an experimental uh, economics type experiment than it is maybe a psychology experiment. Would you agree, Mela? Am I being unfair or is that? I don't think you're being unfair necessarily, but I think a lot of this is being very arbitrarily driven by what a, an economics journal would accept from behavioral economics and what a variety of behavioral science journals would accept. So, for example, psychology, marketing, uh, management science, for example, those types of journals. Um, I, I can see that you would be able to publish behavioral economics research in the journal of consumer psychology yes. i can see it go that way but you can't publish behavioral scientific research which for example might have some type of uh, deception in it or a different type of incentivization which doesn't align with uh, behavioral ex or experimental economics you can't publish that in uh, aer for example that is that just yeah. kind of doesn't happen so one translates much smoother into the other because it's wider i think it's mainly broadness um that sets behavioral science apart from behavioral economics with some quirks, like not being allowed to deceive um, or in the, the <laughs> incentivization structure, which is really quite important within behavioral economics. You, you can't ask participants to do something out of the goodness of their heart. Doesn't work that way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I personally, uh, like my personal take on it, that in 
in in uh, sort of economics journals unless you can replicate somebody else's study they just not gonna publish you period so. <laughs> you know? um. no no i mean there, there were examples of people i know who kind of tried to replicate uh, known studies and they couldn't and they didn't get published um, which i think is you know that this is something that the economics discipline is trying to change i can i can see that there are sort of um there is a uh, there is some, at least a, a discussion towards publishing kind of negative results rather than positive results and uh, mm -hmm. yeah but i mean i don't know anyways um <laughs> yeah um so tell us about um Kind of, I just want to continue this um, um, uh, conversation about PhD. So, in your opinion, is PhD worth it so far? <laughs> so, what a question! <laughs> if you could, if you could yeah, go back, cool. if you could go back, um, you know, to to uh, a point when you decided to do a PhD, would yeah, uh, what would be your decision? Who wants to take the I'd question? I'd still do it. Uh, no, so I, I'll, I'll be very honest. Like, yeah. I, I've complained about, sorry, yeah, no, I, I'll be very honest. I've complained about the PhD loads. Um, I, I am a complainer type person. That's just my entire personality, I'm afraid. Um, but when I, when I look back at it, I started a PhD or I opted in doing a PhD when I think I just turned 21. And when I started the PhD, I was about to turn 22, I think. So I, I was relatively young and I was I, I wasn't, I don't think I was ready or it would have, wouldn't have been to my benefit i think to have you know move to london and work for consultancy or you know what whatever the rest of the people actually ended up doing and i i think the phd was was very challenging and well, still is very challenging especially you know last year Woo. um but i i can't think of myself really doing anything else that would have taught me as much as being in the phd has taught me whether that is for better or for worse that's a different discussion um, but no, I, I think I still ended up here. Um, and I think this has also grown my, my skill set and to some extent uh, me as a person and the type of resilience that I have um, to, to the extent that I would like it to be. So in that regard, I definitely think it's worth it. I also think the field is becoming incredibly oversaturated with regards to the student to actual job ratio. So I think a PhD to that extent I might actually be a competitive advantage even if you're not going into academia, because I know Sarah and I, well, Sarah, even to a larger extent, um, are looking towards industry a lot more than we are looking towards academia. But I feel like I'm just taking the, the words out of Sarah's mouth by this stage. Okay, Sarah, how about you? Was it worth it? <laughs> I'm so, I'm so conflicted. I mean, <laughs> I, it, I think this is, you know, hindsight bias is, is everything. And actually, it's really good for my soul because looking at it from like the fourth year back, I'm sort of saying, you know, I can't imagine where I would be otherwise. I feel like I've learned a lot and I've developed so much since I was, I mean, yeah, I was, you know, 22 when I started and that's a baby. I'm, maybe I'm still a baby now, but uh, yeah, it's been a hell of a journey. And I, I do always, I mean, especially when I'm, I'm talking about PhD publicly, I do always try to present the rose tinted glasses version of everything but i had a pretty terrible start to my <laughs> academic journey which was due to external factors and internal factors um you know people within the department some terrible things happened and i was thrown for a loop and i don't know how much detail i should go into it i don't want to derail the podcast but it was and my mental health just jumped off a cliff. I was in a really terrible, terrible place in my first two years. And it took a lot of support, a good support system and a lot of therapy and a lot of work to stay on the PhD. It was really tough, really tough. But that was my personal experience. And there were things that happened, which I hope don't happen to the majority of people. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's it's always difficult for me to try and recommend a PhD because I I think I've experienced like a bit of a dark underbelly of academia, like a lot of the toxic academic structures and incentives and relationships and bad behavior that gets dismissed mm. because I people mean, publish well. 
Yeah, we we will go a little bit into detail. I hope it's not going to be too. I mean, like, I don't want to traumatize you, Sarah. But uh, yeah, I mean, I just want to uh, ask you about the challenges. You know, what is the most challenging thing about the PhD that you know you because it's very fresh in your experience. I mean, these two just go like, oh, like I'm, you know, I was like 21 or 22 when I started my PhD, blah, blah, blah. And like, I'm, I'm probably still a baby, but like just as a footnote, I'm 40. So like, you know, <laughs> <it's>, <laughs> <laughs> so you're a lot younger. And um, yeah, I just think that's, you know, I think um, um, there are a lot of challenges, right? When you go into PhD and a lot of people before they go into PhD, they consider, you know, how they're going to cope financially, how mm. they're going to, you know, how, what, what is it that they want to do uh, in terms of their PhD? So all these things. So you've, you already kind of almost at the end of your journey with your PhDs. So now looking mm. back at the, that experience, what do you think was the most challenging thing that you uh, encountered? encountered? You want to go first? Do you want to go first? Shall I go first? Okay. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead, Sarah. Yeah. I'll go, I'll go. Um, so I, start, I started the PhD. I had absolutely no idea what was I was in for. I'm, I'm, my parents didn't go to university. So I was, the, I was the first person in my family to get a master's degree, let alone begin a PhD. So I was going in completely blind, like had no idea about how anything worked. I mean, I, I guess a lot of people would be the same, but for me, I struggled a lot with my confidence. I struggled a lot to have, to feel like I had an opinion or had a voice or had something worth saying, like in a group with a thousand smart people. And that was, mm. you know, the imposter syndrome was kind of crippling at times. So I think like from a personal point of view, that was something that I really struggled with, but that I have overcome in a way like doing the podcast itself was a huge step like in me just being able to to voice an opinion or ask questions and in like a I guess a semi-public setting so I've come a long way I mean that plus I guess the uncertainty and like the extreme highs and extreme lows of like everything's going well this week and then the next week something could happen and oh god none of your projects are working you found a bug in your code you've got stepped back five places your supervisor said something to you that's that's ringing in your ears and you go to sleep and you think about it 2 a.m the next week it's going really really well so it's just that emotional roller coaster and just work-life balance trying to find that balance of like steadiness throughout it all has been it's it's tough. It is. It's tough. Mm -hmm. Merle? Uh, yeah, I, I think a lot of what Sarah has already mentioned rings true. I think the main thing that really knocked the ground from under my feet is that, I mean, it, it's both the same with Sarah and I, but we, we came straight out of the educational system. So we finished our master's and we rolled over into a PhD, which in hindsight, and anyone can ask me this, I'll always give the same answer. I don't think I would recommend it personally. I think it is much better for you to enter a PhD when you have had work experience, when you know what it's like to run a project on your own, um, or, or you have some type of life experience that has mentally, uh, psychologically prepared you for this, if you will. Um, but it, it, it was that, the fact that you're suddenly on your own, and instead of going to, to classes and having very clear deadlines and having very clear goals, now it's like, what do you wanna do for your first project? What methodology would you like to apply? Um, from what perspective are you approaching this? Are you approaching this from an economics perspective or a psychology perspective? In my case, the answer is always psychology. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, but it was this, it was the, the fact that you were suddenly, you had no structure, you have a deadline in, in about four years, you know that you need to publish, but you've never done it before. And your supervisors who in the beginning, you're like, well, senpai teach me everything. You see them once a week, which uh, I see my, both my supervisors once a week. And I've been told that I am very, very lucky for it, um, which tells you everything you need to know about a PhD program, <laughs> which, yeah, I mean, it sounds horrendous. So I, I remember um, for me, the second term of my second year, so that's uh, January to March, was just horrid because I felt like everything was collapsing because just like Sarah said, there are going to be times that stuff won't work and seeing your supervisors one hour per week, especially because my, the main skill that I needed to develop throughout the masters and throughout the PhD is the fact that I am not that strong or I wasn't that strong now, I'm quite right, uh, in R. 
And if things stop working in R, you're going to need more than an hour to fix it, especially because only one of my supervisors works in, in that language or that program, if you will. And then suddenly an hour a week is not enough. And if you have five hours worth of problems, that means you just knocked five weeks of progress um, out of you know, your, your planning, if you will. And I'm not saying I'm impatient. I am definitely impatient, but I don't think that's the main issue here. But I'm very pragmatic. So I want to have my targets and I want to hit my targets on time. I don't like things being late. And I like things being very structured and planned. And to try to impose a structure on something as wildly variable as a PhD is very, very difficult. And I think both the lack of structure and the massive switch from being in an educational program to being on your own, that was, I think the, the, those were the main challenges for me. That really was quite a transition. Um, yeah, so before we, I mean, I think it's a nice, you just made a nice transition to my next <laughs> question about data. So I was going to ask you about data, but before we go there, actually, um, something came, came to mind and I just wanted to ask you about um, how is it being, uh, uh, you know, female PhD students in both economics and uh, uh, psychology. So I don't have any experience in psychology, but I was a PhD student in the economics department, and uh, that is like very male-dominated environment. So how do you, uh, I mean, f feel free to tell, to tell me off and say we don't want to address that, but no, <laughs> does, that, does that uh, add additional pressures, or is that now, is it fairly equal? Like, how does that feel, how does it feel now? I guess, yeah, I just want to kind of ch check what the progress is, <laughs> or has there been any progress? So do yeah, you feel different? Question. Do you feel different from? Um, sorry to put you on the spot, um, but like, yeah, do you feel any different from your male colleagues? Yeah, no. I think like no within the actual PhD cohort. Mm. I I don't. I mean, even though if you were just to look at the numbers, like in economics, like we have this leaky pipeline, which isn't you know, uh, you know only economics but it's still very very present when you look at the proportion of female professors and then assistant professors and then associates and and uh phd students there are like we are outnumbered by by men um and it go you know the outnumbering steps up a rank as you go up the professional ladder but i mean within my cohort i don't know about you mel i, I feel like i'm not thinking about my gender with my male colleagues i mean i think in terms of the bigger bigger picture of academia i think that there are so many conversations that we should that we are having i'm glad to say right now about being a woman in the field and the type of research and like gatekeepers in journals and you know I, I, like things like um so my my flatmate he's going on the job market this year so i'm sort of watching him prepare his job market paper going to presentations and in his job market paper which you know uh, we've talked about for hours and hours and hours and I'm very upset that I'm not uh, a co-author on because you know. uh, anyway, uh, <laughs> well, there's there, a, there you go there this is a you know, discrimination case where's my oh, name I know. <laughs> I, yeah exactly. well I know I know that it's his job market paper whatever uh, mm -hmm. but there is this really interesting mechanism that he's like got which is a, a gender mechanism and it's about so it's it's a paper about uh university uh, achievement uh in in portugal his data set it's really interesting and there's this really cool mechanism but he's been dissuaded from bringing up this mechanism about gender because or, you know the people that advise him say that that's going to derail the conversation like you're going to come mm. uh, up against people in the job market who are not going to like that point of view or are fundamentally you know, disagree, or you just shouldn't bring up gender. Don't, it's a difficult topic, you know, it's an interesting mechanism, but yeah, just don't, just don't do it for your job market paper. That makes yeah. me so angry. But, uh, but like I'm just like, least... why not? But at least, uh, you know, you haven't, so I remember once I had this really cool conversation with one of my colleagues, uh, who is a very uh, famous economist, <laughs> he, he kind of drew me a, a, like a normal distribution and said, well, you know, this is basically a distribution of like intellectual capabilities of men, and this is the distribution of uh, intellectual capabilities of women. And uh, 
basically like the average for women was higher than that of men, right? But then like the uh, uh, the tails of the distribution for males were, uh, was like a lot a lot broader than that of females, meaning that in like his point was that on average, like women are like smarter, but mm -hmm. um, uh, men have real geniuses, right? But women mm. <laughs> do not. <laughs> so like you oh, stay with them. I like, hate that. <laughs> so that's like, that's the type of like, um, I mean, I'm not saying that that's universal attitude, but I mean, but it's good I to hear, not. it's good to hear that, you know, at least, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's getting on the, yeah, it's, it's getting better. <laughs> I'm hoping yeah. anyway. <laughs> well, I, not, I think not this genius better. thing is true. Well, no, I, I mean, I think this, this the perception about genius is still really true about, you know, that, I mean, when you look at who's like at the top, top of their no, field, like I'm it's sorry, so male. But I yeah, but I have such an issue with the term genius. I have oh, such it, an yes, issue with completely. that term. It's bullshit. It's just, it's just, Let's just say no, that. It is complete bullshit because I'm sorry, yeah. but like to be a genius in a, especially in a field like academia, like I'm, I'm sure there's many ways to be clever. And I'm sure there's some people like when I think genius, for example, I think of someone doing absolutely incomprehensible mathematics. Like, I'm sorry, that is my perception of it. Um, I, I guess behavioral science to some extent doesn't qualify for that. Uh, although I've seen, I've seen some uh, complex cogn cognition models where I'm like, I'm not entirely sure what I'm looking at. So maybe people do qualify for that. But it's just this idea of, you know, predominantly male. I'm sure they're very clever. They're also incomprehensible when they on, you know, day-to-day -day speech. Uh, they're very likely an asshole. And being smart is absolutely no excuse for being an asshole. You're going to have to work on a personality. Being smart isn't the personality. Um, and you know that that type of stuff, and I'm and I'm kind of like, I'm kind of over this idea of geniuses because what happens was that you you were very clever, and I'm not saying you've never worked hard in your life, but very likely you come from a lot of privilege and you were at the right place at the right time. Like I'm mm -hmm. sorry, but that does not make you a genius. It just doesn't. That's not how yeah. this works. Well, it's lazy. Yeah, I have to say there are, <laughs> there are exceptions, of course. I mean, there are very, yeah, of very notable exceptions uh, in uh, in the uh, economics field. Uh, there are very nice people who are, you know, also very good economists. So we don't mean uh, like all people, but yeah, of course, yeah, this is uh, this sounds. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm kind of glad that it's, the situation is improving, and uh, well, in in some in some ways, and probably does not mm. improve in other ways. Okay, so um, um, Merle, you started to kind of talk about data and coding and all that. But before we go mm. into this, um, I just wanted to ask you about, um, you know, what data means to you personally, just as a person. Um, <laughs> uh, Lots and, of pain and anguish. <laughs> and, and do you feel generational divide between yourself, your family, people you know, uh, your supervisors and yourself? So is there any um, other, uh, any kind of, um, are there any ways in which you use data or think about data that is different from other people? That is a really good question. I think to the extent, as soon as you start using data, um, I think you really come up face to face with the amount of things that any company actually knows and collects about you, uh, which you can ask that from, from social media has to hand that over. I think that's part of the TNCs. So if I now were to ask Twitter, send me everything you have on me, I'm going to say, I'm going to get book works of information, which quite frankly, I don't want to have. Um, I was going to say, <laughs> yeah, I think the I fact want that. that no, I really don't want that. I really like space as is. Um, but I think, you know, the, that Facebook documentary, documentary that uh, came out not too long ago, or sorry, that social media documentary, because you're not supposed to say Facebook specifically, um, that showed how much, you know, how the algorithm worked, how much is actually being collected about you. I think that was quite eye-opening to a lot of people. Uh, I think once you've been in behavioral science or especially data science for a long time, this, this whole value or no surprise to you. Um, but I think, I think it's predominantly that. I think it's predominantly knowing how much of your information is out there, uh, how much of other people's information is out there, and, and how you can actually use that for research purposes um, and, and, you know, find some really, really cool stuff about human behavior in there, but then also understand how a whole bunch of companies who are, might be very, very much research-driven, but with a 
a profit goal on the back of their head can really do a lot of damage with that type of data. I think, I think data is a good thing in and of itself. I think how you use it is where the problems lie. That's, that's how I approach data. Um, I mean, do I think there's a generational gap? I don't think I'm going to have this discussion with my grandmother. Uh, for one, she's dead, so that's going to be quite difficult. Um, but I don't think that's a generation to talk to about this, but I think anyone under anyone under 50 could quite easily have this conversation, especially if they're trained in this field or if they have moved towards this field. So to some extent, I mean, the person that taught me coding is 45. So to some extent, is there, so to some extent, is there then a massive generational divide? I, I don't think so. I think it's more of where your expertise lies, where your interest lies. I wouldn't blame it on age necessarily. Okay. Now, Sarah, what's your take <laughs> well, on this? What's my hot take? Um, data, I, I feel like data is like this Pandora's box of like, you know <laughs> that someone is out there collecting data on you and it's almost like part and parcel of, yes, I want to access these services or I want to use this app or uh, yeah. And you just don't read the T's and C's and you click. Yeah. Okay. I consent. Just, you know, take my cookies, take my data. It's, Take my it's just become, yeah, it's just become an accepted sort of transactional process. There doesn't seem to be any cost to you for doing that. Mm. You know, it just seems to be like you click a button, you're straight through. Mm. And I, I do find myself like, I think similar to Mele, like not wanting to actually know how much data is out there, like about me, because I think it would, it would, it would bother me a lot. Like, even though I know it's out there, I know that someone could basically pick uh, like a portfolio like they would they would know they could be able to see things like when i was lonely like when am i checking social media or like going on a dating app like mm -hmm. being able to see into my personal life like more than i think that i'm allowing them it's like this one way mirror essentially um and it's i think it's comfortable to stay in this like little pocket of ignorance and just trust and hope that there are regulator regulators or institutions that will protect you and protect your data but i mean da data it's like it's currency it has it has value but you don't own your own data essentially it's yeah. really really strange i mean i i think if if i was to think about a generational divide it would just be uh maybe in in the sense of if you've grown up using technology and you know you you see this of like kids like trying to touch screens that aren't touch screen and they just assume <laughs> that everything is like at this interface yeah. level uh it's you're you're desensitized in a sense to data because it's like not something you've ever ha you haven't really ever had to really fill out anything in paper like paperwork mm. form or like uh Done the, I mean, it's like sort of like, I guess, like the pain of paying the actual physicality of data. You've never really had that yeah. much experience with. It's all just at, behind like a, a screen somewhere, saved on a hard drive somewhere. So the sensitivity to it, I think, is a bit different. And, and also, I guess, in just in the way that we use, I mean, social media as well. I always mm. find that, uh, that there are these life cycles of social media which are really interesting about which ones survive about how the users change so like facebook now i mean i've actually uh deleted like facebook and instagram apps from my phone because Same. i just i just didn't enjoy the experience of using them i've i would i always like go and look at my phone like when i'm bored like that's my automatic reaction or when my mind drifts slightly and i just open up all the apps so I found that the less apps are on my phone, the less likely I am to actually look at them. I create like these barriers for myself. Um, so, I mean, maybe I spend too much time now on BBC News because I've got less apps, but you know, I, I find it like now there are people using Facebook who are, I guess are an older generation. And I, it's, it's just interesting to see these new technologies and new uh, ways of collecting data and new, new social media mm. platforms pop up it's i think it's yeah it's it's uh it's a, it's an ever continuing evolution of of uh, social media and uh, yeah there, i think there are lots you can say about generational divides particularly in use of facebook i think 
you know, no, I uh, think you mentioned the really interesting one, Sarah, this, this idea of being completely desensitized to giving up your data, because there's, there's no way for an individual to actually recognize its value, um, because we are not our own advertising agencies for good reasons. But I, I think, you know, I, I, because I remember now so, uh, like quite specifically that I've had discussions with my dad where I'm just, I'm supposed to go through something, read something just so I can use the platform, the app, whatever. And I'm just like, my dad's sitting next to me reading or whatever. And I just click the TNCs and I just hope to be able to move on. Or um, I'm going through a contract for like a freelance writing job or whatever. And all of this looks really standard to me. It's like, we just brush through it because that's kind of what we're used to. Um, whereas I think all the generation is or maybe this is just my dad specifically who knows um but he's like no no you, you, you can't just click that you're gonna have to go through that so my dad used to be uh, an, an accountant so he, he knows the letter of, of the law at least the financial law quite well and he knows that you know if there's only one letter wrongly printed you can get royally screwed over um so maybe it's his profession that, that sets him apart but it's just this idea of we don't read the TNCs. We really don't care what they do with our data. We've got no clue what our data is anyway, and we're just going to give it up. This is something that I do think there is much more, um, much, much more hesitation in the older generations because they didn't grow up with it, um, because they don't think the TNCs of being able to use something on your laptop, computer, or tablet, whatever, that's not something that they find very normal. And I think having not grown up in something like that and just questioning what's going on i mean that that's a core part of critical thinking so I, you're then looking at what this type of you know what these types of actions what these types of choices might do to our critical thinking approach if that is a result of generational gap well we are in for a wild ride because then we're just very slowly being turned into sheep the sheeple <laughs> so uh yeah i mean um you know like we at, at, at the alan tuning institute uh, we all have i think like professional deformation with uh, privacy mm -hmm. so i just remembered like i have a friend who um, before the lockdown started she went to a hairdresser and when she arrived they said would you like to put your iphone on charge while you were like well you kind of we attend to you here and she went like no thank you <laughs> and like most people probably would say yes to that because sure yeah i want to charge my phone but yeah i mean we are all a little bit paranoid uh, because of the work that we do uh, and yeah i mean yeah i guess i guess uh, also what i wanted to ask you is do you register these things like when um maybe not even from the data perspective but like when you buy something do you say oh actually i know that trick from you know from behavioral science that's what they're doing that they're trying to upsell me now and so do you do you do you have that or do you register that when you or it's like completely two different personalities when say you are shopping and when you're living in your real life and your professional <laughs> life um, because like the next question I wanted to ask you is yeah how what like how does data factor in behavioral science and um, behavioral economics so yeah so that's like a, a complex question I guess so in a way how do you use data in your professional life and do you have this professional deformation going into like real life in terms of data and and tricks in fact that you mm -hmm. learned <laughs> Oh, I, I can definitely recognize it when I see it. And I I'm, I think like the, the best example that I can pull from my memory is uh, the like Domino's app. Um, you get all the way to the checkout, you put all the stuff in your basket, and mm. this is going to make me really want a Domino's. I haven't had one in a long time. But so. then right at the end, just above the, you know, click here to pay button, they have, you know, oh, why don't you just add this? this last thing to your basket and it's actually a discounted version of what's on the actual menu so i know that they're not going to put the discount on the main menu it's own they're only going to apply it right at the end so i can sort of be like well i can sort of trick myself and pretend that i actually wanted that in the first place and now i'm now i'm getting a really good deal uh, but it's, mm -hmm. it's essentially the same trick as you know putting stuff by the the checkout you know like we we've seen this you know, happen in the real world, the same sort of technique, but it's, I think it's more powerful in that online application, like data heavy, like you can tailor that information. Like if you know this person's order and what they get all the time, you can recommend things to them that you know that they're going to find it difficult to resist. And 
I would say as a caveat, even though I can sort of recognize behavioral science being used for good or for bad, like in my mm. own experiences, it doesn't mean I'm any less likely to nope. fall for it in a sense. Um, I don't know. I don't know. Merle, do you, do you look around the world at, at, and see behavioral science and data science everywhere or is it just me? I don't think I see it everywhere. I mean, I'm wary of the amount of TNCs I've approved in my life. <laughs> I'll give you that much. But I mean, for me specifically, like, because, because I'm in payment systems. So for me, things like Amazon's like one click buy system, I look at that and I'm just like, no, absolutely under no circumstances. I don't have my car details saved. I don't want them saved anywhere. I want to make the, the decision to go online shopping um, and then actually buying something, I want to make it as difficult as humanly possible for myself because I know otherwise that I will have absolutely no money left in my bank account because I do actually like to go shopping a lot, hmm. um, which is not that feasible on a PhD wage. So as I'm aware of these types of systems. I'm aware of making, um, of how a purchase can be made easier, uh, more expensive for the consumer, that they, buy, that they make you buy more and more frequently uh, you know, which, which Domino's or any type of food app is, is really, really good at. Um, this, this type of stuff. I'm aware of it, but it's for me, it's mainly the, the, the payment systems and the, and the personal finance side where I'm actually, you know, very carefully just disabling everything. Uh, so no one click buy systems, no card payments, savings. I don't have accounts for most of these pages. So they don't save my personal details, like my, my name and my email. I don't want any of it saved. Not even from like a data point, but just making it hard for myself to be able to do this in an easy and fast manner. Because I know as soon as you say easy and fast, like as a consumer, you've lost. You've lost so hard. <laughs> Yeah, so um, just coming back to the professional use of data. So is it still small data in behavioral science and behavioral economics? Like how do you, how do you use data in your kind of professional life uh, in your PhD? Or do you already see this shift towards larger data sets? Especially now with COVID that everything was online this year. Is that, mm. does, that mean, does that mean that data sets become bigger and less uh, like, yeah, lower quality, I guess? I, I think there's definitely a desire, I think, to move the field towards a more like uh, big data and like machine learning techniques. I think it's just finding the the people with those skills. Like I think it's difficult within economics to accumulate those skills because you probably have to be teaching yourself a lot of it or, or, or really trying to find a mentor mm -hmm. Uh, who has either, either comes from like, you know, different fields, uh, sort of a, a hybrid across different um, applications of behavioral science or uh, just did it first, like in terms of learning how to, how to code and learning how to, you know, use big data. But there's definitely a desire for it. I mean, as an experimental economist, we're very much into creating our own data sets, you know, uh, as I guess this is a, just a different way of, of accumulating knowledge, but within the f discipline of economics, like the empirical work that there's a lot of, uh, a lot of incentives to produce really rigorous empirical work in terms of publishing. Um, so the, the more this data becomes available, I think it's almost like the data is the carrot. Oh no, the, no, wait, what's my metaphor? The data is the <laughs> stick. The right that you can hold out, like get that publishing carrot. If the data is there, people will use it, especially mm -hmm. if they can reap the benefit mm -hmm. of it. Um, yeah, but I think there's just a little bit of friction at the moment in terms of finding the right skills to actually understand and use big data effectively. Yeah. Two cents. All right. So let's go, Sarah, Marilyn now. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I mean, I, I am very much in agreement with Sarah. I do think there is a drive towards, well, you know, if you can run an analysis on like 100 people, it's probably better if you run it on 100,000 or 100 million. Fair play. It, it increases the, the value of the statistics. That's completely fair. Um, the, the idea that big data is going to solve a lot of the issues that we've run into with behavioral science, I'm not that keen on. I do think that the word uh, big data or larger data sets or however you want to call it is to some extent being used as a, as a, as a quick fix um, to, to undo some of the damage that we've seen in the, re in the replication crisis. I am 100% pro using large data sets, by the way, but I don't believe in them uh, as a quick fix for the nonsense that we, we've seen um, 
in, in, the, in the past or in the previous decade, if you will. Um, because I mean, if you if you can p hack uh, an experiment with a hundred people, you can p hack data of a hundred thousand people. Like it's it's not that different. It just isn't. Um, I do. F I'm not entirely sure if the data we're gathering, because it's bigger and bigger, is of lower quality. I do think there should be better mechanisms in place for collecting the data and knowing what data you're actually looking at. I'm currently struggling with that in a, in a transactional data set where I am pretty sure some variables were not correctly measured or just aren't, are not what they claim to be or just aren't, just, it's not clean, the data isn't clean, uh, essentially. Um, but I, I do feel like our, our main concern currently is that as a behavioral economist, uh, like Sarah, or as a behavioral scientist like me, we are trained in statistical analysis. Uh, I mean, Sarah knows data very well, I would argue that I know R decently. But we're not computer scientists. Like we are not data scientists by any stretch of the imagination. That is not the training that we have had. So if we want to move behavioral science towards that, either we need or behavioral economics uh, as well, of course, then we need to make sure that we actually provide that type of training without taking away from this from teaching the skill set, which actually allows you to run causal studies and decent experiments, and that you still know what the statistics behind it means. Um, and of course, without you know taking time away from topical knowledge and the, the, the theories that are behind the field and how the field developed. So essentially, you're just adding an entirely new uh, skill set. So this, the, the programs, the master programs or the undergraduate programs are just getting more and more busy <laughs> and you'll have less and less time to, to learn more skills, which I'm not necessarily against. I mean, Another way of, of you know, pushing this field forward is, of course, a closer merger between data science, computer science, and behavioral science. But I think that merger is happening already anyway. So that's, that is definitely something uh, to look forward to. Yeah, so talking about um, uh, kind of perfect, most creative uh, behavioral project that uses data in the most effective and creative way in your view, can you give me an example of like, one from your field? But maybe a paper you read and you think, okay, well, that's kind of a very nice piece of work that I can really see the, you know, see that that's creative and effective and uses data in the best way possible. It doesn't have to be obviously data science one, just behavioral <laughs> science, behavioral economics one that you like. Something uh, that you read so, during so, your PhD. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, so sudden, suddenly I wish I wasn't so focused on personal finance because a lot of that stuff is still survey based, which is just not ideal. Um, I mean, in all fairness, like most of the, if the literature that I, I look at, if it's not survey or sl slightly experimentally based, let's not overextend ourselves here. Um, the data that they would look at is transactional data. So I think almost any paper that has used transa transactional data, and then I mean clean transactional data, meaning that a, a bank has actually figured out what they're doing with this data or a credit card company, if you will. Anything done with that type of data, I, I always tend to like because there is just such a wealth of information in transactional data if you get it from a bank. Um, I can I can literally figure out what type of yogurt you like if you're lactose intolerant you know I go if you like pizza or not if you like vegan pizza or whatever you know you can figure that out from transactional data which I personally think is great um, the consumer might not agree with me so any type of paper that has, that has come out with regards to that so there is um the the University of Sydney and Harvard Star Lab. And Chicago Booth have a collaboration with a big Australian bank uh, who use that type um, of academic research on, on their data, which I think has produced some really, really cool papers. Uh, specific ones don't come to mind, but any type of that work where, where we're looking at big transactional data, that's, uh, that, that, that's really my jam. That's really my cup of tea. So any of that work, I'm, uh, I've always been really keen on. Cool. Uh, Sarah, for you? God, uh, you're putting me on the spot here. I to be honest, I don't think I've read enough uh, papers uh, that actually use big data, like in an in an interesting or an innovative way. I think, I mean, maybe it's yeah, just small, because I'm... yeah, small data is fine. Can you give oh, me? Okay, so... Do you have a favorite favorite paper which uses uh, you know behavioral uh, behavioral economics data in the most effective way? Like, what's your favorite paper, basically? <laughs> That's the question. What's my favorite paper? Okay, I can answer that question. It's, it's, uh, 
uh, well, Nisi Rostaccini, either a fine is a price or pay enough or don't pay at all. I love those papers. So That's cool. Fun. And and Aldo, I Aldo even will say... be, uh, yeah, Aldo will be pleased. Aldo, hello if you listen. I'm not sure you listen <laughs> hey, to us. Just, but, um, yeah, I, I just yeah, I love I love Aldo's work. Yeah, I, I mean I remember oh, one so conference good. he came and he was presenting this paper that dealt with competition, and the example he used was like bird competition, and then he he showed how like bird competition and human competition is essentially very similar. So yeah, he does some cool work. So yeah, I'm, I'm with you there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it's 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 the narratives and the storytelling, and it like those type of papers for some reason they stick in my brain. Like they have their own little place in my brain. The mechanisms are so interestingly explored and so neat um, and I think it's only really when you come to actually trying to design your own experiment that you can appreciate how bloody difficult it is to design something that's really internally valid but also interesting outside of the lab right essentially um, I mean I I think from from my perspective with with data it's not necessarily the use of big data sets that I have sort of noticed, but more in terms of the increase in um, observability in sort of people's lives and sort of their beliefs and what motivates them. And also like, you know, the more data we have and the more technology we have, the more ways we can try and observe the same behavior or, or motivating factor. So it kind of, in I guess, is enriching uh, the way that we, uh, understand like sort of knock-on effects and the effects of interventions in that sense. I mean, I've done mm. a lot of work on my PhD really trying to think about um, a bias in uh, self-reports of behavior, you know, and whether or not there are some in interactions with uh, uh, sort of how you self-report behavior and whether or not you've been exposed to some sort of behavioral intervention like it are the mechanisms through which that intervention is going to try and change your behavior also changing the way that you report that behavior and so for me measurement has been really at the the forefront of my mind for the past like three or four years so the more ways that we have to observe something i think that really enriches the story and also gives us an opportunity to uh examine whether the the effects the knock-on effects the whole sort of holistic picture of people's lives you know, and sort of actually taking a, a fuller, you know, understanding of what the effects are of these behavioral interventions. Because, you know, unintended consequences, I mean, that's Nisi and Rustaccini, like that, that's the sort of the stories that they, they tell about, you know, okay, you want to increase uh, the proportion of parents that pick up their kids on time, let's just put in some sort of fine and, oh no, look mm. what's happened here. It's had the opposite effect. So those are like neatly yeah. designed studies where the, they were able to observe the unintended consequence, you know, I guess it basically uh, designed it in a way that uh, the unintended consequence was exactly the outcome that they were measuring. It moved in the opposite direction. But in, in, in a lot of behavioral science and a lot of, uh, I guess, the papers that I've, I've read that sort of look at interventions, maybe public health interventions, for example, there are always going to be unintended effects of introducing mm -hmm. something new into people's lives but it's you know if we don't observe them then we can't you know include them into a sort of a welfare analysis so for me that's going to be a really powerful role of of data is increasing observability at what cost though <laughs> is the question yeah yeah but uh yeah, so you, you both uh, started to mention these uh, sort of uh, pressures uh, about coding and learning some programming. So in terms of this, uh, you know, skill sets that you need, um, do you feel pressure to learn, I don't know, Python or R or some other programs that are out there now? So how, how large are these pressures in, in behavioral science slash behavioral economics? Oh, I, wouldn't even call it, other, other I, I wouldn't even call it, the, uh, are there pressures? I, mm, I, I don't think currently, and I don't know if you would define this as a pressure. I just, I kind of don't think you have much of a choice, <laughs> which I mean, then maybe that's actually the definition of a pressure. So uh, is there a trend to, to, you know, towards more, so because like, you know, back in the day, 
um, economics wasn't very mathematical. And then we had all these uh, sort of people from NASA who got fired and eventually they all went into economics. So we saw that this boom of mathematics in economics at one point. So now we see, I think, uh, kind of the boom of programming. I'm not sure whether it reached economics and uh, behavioral science. So I'm just wondering, do you see that or is it still yeah. relatively, um, you know, um, yeah. So, so is that, uh, yeah, is that quite conservative still? So or do you see people, if, you know, you need to code, you need to, you need to learn how to code. I, I think this, the status quo bias is so real. I mean, and it's also like a sunk cost effect as well. You have people who've learned to program in one language. So in economics, you learn to program in Stata, you know, and Stata is the sort of, uh, you know, made specifically for economists and sort of social scientists. So you learn a version of programming that it you once you learn that type of programming, yes, it's sort of easier to pick up other languages, but it's not, you know, directly re related to how you code in R, for example. So I often think like now we sort of say, okay, everyone just learns how to code in Stata and because, you know, the people that are publishing, they don't want to learn a new language. There's sort of a sense that let Stata is just good enough for now. I think, I think there definitely is a push to try and move us towards something else, like something more generalizable like i've tried to learn r myself um which you know n nothing within the phd program really has encouraged me or pushed me towards doing that just me myself sort of seeing the trends and being like okay i think this is a skill that i should have when i enter the the job market ac uh, academic or industry but yeah i think it's a slow one to change when people are already sort of ingrained in okay yeah, i know uh this this is enough yeah. yeah, there are already uh, this, um, you know, there are already tools in Stata that uh, allow you to um, to do, for example, text analytics, um, like latent directly analysis you can now do in Stata. So I think there are these, um, um, there is also um, Peter Moffat, hi Peter. Uh, <laughs> Peter Moffat did an actually really nice herding, herding code for Stata as well, which is kind of a two-stage code, allows you to kind of strip data set of all the zeros and then, you know, work with kind of meaningful data. So that's also like a big data tool in a sense. I mean, you only need it if you have really large data sets with, with lots of zeros. Mm. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, in that sense, I guess, uh, it doesn't really matter what it is that you learn, right? I mean, is it Stata, is it R, is it Python? But I mean, I think there are, like, when I talk to data, so the reason I ask you is that when I talk to data scientists, a lot of them tell me, oh, you need to learn Python. Like, if you don't know Python, then, like, your life is, <laughs> your life is over <laughs> pretty much. So I'm just wondering whether that's the, the case in, in behavioral science uh, in economics. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen the move towards Python to the extent that I had expected, um, because I know Python is used quite a bit within neuroscience. And like you said, it's, it's used within data science a lot. So I, I had expected that move to be quicker in behavioral science. Now, I also have a feeling that we might be quite biased. It was obviously so Neil Stewart, my, uh, my, one of my supervisors, he codes in R. I'm sure he knows Python, but he prefers to code in R. So as a result, everyone he supervises codes in R. And his collaborators very often are at least R compatible um, or you know, the, the code gets delegated to, to someone else. So it really doesn't matter that much. So except for you know ignoring economics uh, department in uh, warwick university the warwick university codes in r i would say essentially um and python is, is slowly up and coming although i mean it's it's been around for so long slowly up and coming is not really the right way of phrasing it but i i think this might also just just depend on the university this this might depend uh you know from university to university is different from department to department it's different um it might be different in, in country to country i generally don't know um I do expect that I will not be able to avoid learning Python within the next five years to, to complement what I know or can do to some extent in R and probably massively extend what I can do in R because R is not really a programming language. It might become that, who knows, but I am... Um, I feel in general that that is a, a pressure, if you will, the fact that you need to know statistical analysis in a language um, by this time by this period i don't think it's it's a pressure i think it's it's a given 
um, you don't really have a choice. <laughs> okay. Well, um, yeah, so um, it's a trick question <laughs> coming up. Um, I want to ask you about this hybrid fields. So we now have the social data science, behavioral data science. Uh, do you find that relevant at all to what you do? Is it something that, um, you know, is of interest to you? Or do you feel is of interest to people you study with? That is I, a good I, question. I think so. I think I think these hybrid fields are the the fields where the most innovation is going on. And uh, honestly, you know, economics, uh, but any academic subject benefits when you have, when you're including more perspectives and more backgrounds and opinions and whether or not that's from a training perspective for people trained in a completely different discipline coming and sort of lending their perspective to behavioral science. I think it's only going to enrich the field. I think it's maybe you know, the hybrids tend to be relatively small in numbers. Um, so it's, you know, day to day, if I'm in my economics department at University of Nottingham, everyone is a, like a basic bitch economist, really. <laughs> so it's to find those perspectives, you have to step out of your own bubble. I think it definitely enriches the field. And uh, it's kind of those who, there's a bit of selection there. You can always if you're comfortable within sort of your economist bubble, behavioral economist bubble, you can stay in there comfortably. There's enough going on in that bubble to get you published, right? There's enough people to interact with, but you're not going to innovate the field unless, unless you step out of it is, is my opinion. Yeah, I All think right? that's very fair. Uh, I do think a lot of people get a bit too caught up in, in their own niche, um, which is when you start halting development. I, I have no issue with a lot of people. So my favorite type of innovation, which is how behavioral economics or behavioral science, you, you can debate the, the name and the origin of the field, uh, how it got started. It's just a different field looking into, you know, economics at the time and being like, I, we don't think this is how it works and starting to critique it where different methodologies and, and different starting points meet each other. And I think that's where the most innovation happens. And I have no real qualms with these these hybrid niches or these hybrid fields where some subsections uh, of the field meet each other and, and do the same and replicate the same but i think to a, to a smaller extent i'm all pro innovation but it's just like sarah said like you have to stick your head out of your own bubble and to some extent um i'm wondering if these these mergers in these these very hybrid niches is just a, a softer way of trying to re-innovate and rebuild the field. I, I'm much more a proponent of like drawing in other uh, bigger fields like computer science into behavioral science because otherwise because I currently, and, and I'm perfectly happy to, to have people disagree with me, I'd rather they did actually, that I've become kind of complacent in behavioral science and I think um, I think David Parrott has written an article about this, but I think uh, Jason Collins has, has made comments in this direction as well, where the field is reaching a, a local maximum or a local optimum and we're, we're becoming kind of stagnant, as in this, the stuff that we're, we're pushing out is from people who are trained behavioral economists or trained behavioral scientists is becoming very, very just a, a, a big pot of the same shit, same methodology slightly different phenomenon push it out get published and you know take a famous journal and whatever and like the the, the revolution has kind of died out which is is the worst thing for a field <laughs> i don't know I, I feel like maybe i'm just looking in, in the wrong uh, angles maybe i should dive deeper into these these hybrid niches uh, and find some really cool stuff but i've I've been a, a bit less excited about the field recently, so maybe it's time for me. I, I switch topics and I switch into a, uh, I should switch into a new niche, um, which is very much not an answer to your actual question. <laughs> okay, so let's just maybe change uh, change the subject to make it uh, to to talk about something else. So. Um, you know, I've been uh, watching quite uh, with, with some interest, I have to say, and taken pictures mm -hmm. and videos of um, behavioral design during COVID. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. And I know you guys looked into this topic very deeply from different angles, especially in your uh, in your own um, podcast. So, um, in your view, like, what are your what is your take? What are your views on behavioral design during COVID? Is it a um, is it a massive success, massive failure? No. Is it hit and miss? Like, what is it? And you can tell me from like it, it from uh, you know you can answer it as experts or answer it as uh, users of this the behavioral design. That's it's up to you. So, what's your take? <laughs> Oh, I know Mela has feelings about this. Mela, please. Tell. I have feelings Mella. about everything. No, the, the thing is, as um, as an expert, I can't answer this as an expert because, quite frankly, I don't do intervention type stuff. Uh, that that's very much more uh, Sarah's wheelhouse. Um, if I'm looking at this as as a user, I can't make head or tails of it. I genuinely can't. Um, so I'm I'm from the Netherlands myself. I think that government has done slightly better but that doesn't mean much than the uk government and it's just you can't make heads or tails of what interventions they're running you can't make heads or tails of what they want you to do stay inside but you only have to stay inside from next friday onwards we're just announcing it now so you can get prepared i'm just like the virus doesn't care if i get prepared or not that's that's not really how it works i think there's a lot of miscommunication i think they they should have started incorporating economists and proper policy makers and behavioral scientists and sociologists much earlier in the debate. I think they waited too long with that. Um, although I can understand why the focus was on epidemiologists, if I even pronounce that correctly. But it's just, it, it was just a mess. It shows that we're very clearly not prepared for dealing with something on such a large scale and communicating effectively what we want from people on a large scale. Very clearly, we are not able to do that. Sarah? Yeah. I know. Oh yeah, me. Okay, so I. <laughs> well, you kind of so you kind of do fun. health, right? You do well, you do health applications. Oh, in, uh, exactly. In I ish. should be talking about this like an expert. <laughs> should should is the word here. Um, I think there are so many examples. I mean, I'm I'm just thinking about the experience of living with COVID in the UK because that's sort of all I can really pull on in my personal experience but I think there are so many examples where you can sort of say that oh that is not what a behavioral scientist would suggest doing mm -hmm. like things like uh having people like members of of parliament like not obey the rules that they're asking everyone to obey and be compliant to that's like a real big compliance no-no like you know we know that in a lot of contexts the messenger matters and yeah so like things like that and, and also i think that in a sense what this has shown us is that uh you know we need behavioral science in the diagnostic phase not just the intervention phase i think behavioral science it it offers us these nice sort of soft interventions in some places where we don't have to change too much about the environment but we can sort of you know uh, influence behavior you know, it, from this sort of uh, understanding like the mechanical processes of, of the way people's minds work and, and why they do the things they do. But if, when it comes to a pandemic, sometimes we actually need to think about, you know, what are the, the structural things that need to happen here? Uh, and I think like Mela said, like bringing in experts like who know about, you know, education and like what would be the effect of closing schools. I mean, it's always this sort of cost benefit analysis. You can think of it in that way. Um, to be honest, I think it's a difficult situation because everyone was sort of experimenting in a sense with what to do. There was no handbook or guidebook. I mean, we can always talk about in hindsight, yeah. you know, what they should have done. I think, I think now it's, it's, we have more information and we have, uh, I guess more distance from like I guess the initial interventions like the messaging campaigns or the eat out to help out scheme that's not really behavioral science here but uh you know mm. with with hindsight we can say that was a terrible idea why why did we do that um yeah. yeah I mean it's just a big convoluted complicated mess I think there are definitely like behavioral lines that you can draw and ways in which you can like analyze like the the interventions and think you know think about okay well what was their intention here and what was their goal was it to move behavior and how on earth did they think that this was going to do the job um i think like masks are a really interesting one uh, as well yeah. like you know is 
it's like, first of all, do people understand what masks do? Like, what is their function? Like, to Mm -hmm. protect themselves or is it to protect other people? So there's that informational aspect. And then also, you know, the, the sort of the social watching what other other people do and sort of following other people's behavior um it's it's really powerful so if you walk into a, a room and everyone's wearing a mask you'll probably want to put a mask on too there's a, mm-hmm. a there's sort of a certain level where it's like if it's 50 50 then it's more of a a choice rather than a, mm. a pressure so yeah no but just know. in general it should it should have never been a pressure it should have never even resembled a choice it should have been legislated much better and it should have been legislated much quicker and that is something that i find i, I mean d- despite the many structural issues in, in in other places but the west was way too way too soft like it it sounds it sounds a bit a bit fucked up knowing the the rest of the world's history but the west was just way too soft it was not legislated properly it wasn't enforced properly um, everyone's like, nah, masks are uncomfortable. I'm like, okay, well then, then you fucking catch COVID then. Like, it seems really, really harsh, but it's just, this, this should have been legislated. This, it should have been communicated very clearly. This is what a mask does. Um, this is why you're wearing it. This is why we're enforcing it. This is the fine. Because there's people who during periods of self-isolation were, you know, happy campers just walking about. And like the fine for this in the UK was supposed to be like 10,000 pounds or something absolutely insane. But who's heard of anyone who's actually gotten that fine? You can't threaten with something that's never going to be enforced. Like people aren't dumb. But do you feel that it's um, it's more about... um... Generally, I think uh, I think it's the same with climate change, and it does, it's the same mm-hmm. as, for example, cybersecurity. The majority of behavioral interventions that I saw, I don't know, like from your perspective, tell me whether I'm I'm right here or wrong. Um, the majority of behavioral inter- interventions that I saw, like you should do this or you die or whatever, you know, it's all about <laughs> it's all about scaring people, right? Like mm. if you like. You, everyone should wear masks, blah, blah, blah. But people are actually not told, like, what exactly, how do I decrease my probability of infecting others or getting infected by wearing a mask? Uh, there are also very different um, very different uh, guidelines of the distance, right? In some sure. countries, it's one and a half meters. In other countries, it's two meters. In some countries, I heard one meter. So it's like um, there is not there's that so that much matters variety. at all because- <laughs> because no one actually knows how long two meters is. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we don't know how, you know, the sur- like if, if the, you know, the c- contingent is on the surface, we don't know, like, whether you're gonna, you know, c- yeah, we're gonna, gonna contract anything or not. Like, you don't know how long this stuff lives on, like, surfaces. And, sure. you know, there's, so there is a lot of this. And um, what I'm wondering is, like, why is no one explaining risk to people? Like, why? I, of course, it's more difficult to explain risk to people, but uh, no one says, okay, if you do this, the pro- you decrease probability of contracting by this much or whatever. Um, so, like, do you do you feel the same that it's, um, or do you feel differently that you know? It, do you need to scare people, or do you? No. Or sometimes you do need to scare people, and sometimes you need to explain to them what's going on. Like, what's your? I think we would have been much better off if we had been honest. I mean, it it came out after a while that absolutely no one in politics had any clue what was going on, and as soon as you lose that type of credibility, it's just downhill from there. Granted that you believe politicians had an ounce of credibility to start with, uh, <laughs> that might change uh, per country, but it it should have been made clearer. We want you to wear a mask, and we might or might not enforce you wearing a mask because of these and these reasons. This is how contamination properly works, et cetera, et cetera. Now, if we had known from the get-go how these things would have worked, I think this would have been very clear communication. But to be quite frank, I don't think we knew in the beginning any of the numbers or any of the real risks. And as such, I can imagine that, you know, politicians and experts alike might have chosen to ignore them because there wasn't a very clear answer. I can get that argument. But to then start scaring people instead is maybe not exactly ideal because that has just more than backfired. Because if you scare people with the idea of if you don't wear a mask, you're going to die. Or if you don't stay two meters apart, you are going to die. Uh, given that that is a very inductive argument, because if you're not dead yet, that's not a yeah, very good Yeah, because like when you don't die, like we had this conversation with a friend of mine who said, you know, I walked into a, a like public bathroom. 
and someone mm. sneezed. And the first oh. thing I thought, oh shit, I'm going to die. Like, you know, this is it. Like I'm going to get sick now. <laughs> so and I said, I came home like and 24 hours went by and I was like, okay. And then like another day, day went by. And then I thought, you know what? Like if someone sneezes, <laughs> and sneezes next to me, maybe I'm not going to die. So that's yeah. okay. <laughs> right? mm. And that's, uh, yeah. so I think like to me, that's the problem, right? Like if you, yeah. Yeah, if there is no circum, no consequence that that they promise to you, whatever, then you're yeah. not gonna pay attention. You're gonna stop paying attention if something bad doesn't happen, in a sense. Right? Yeah. No, absolutely. I, I, th I think that's the tricky thing with with risk as well is that, you know, by definition, doing the right action, you know, th there's not always certainty in the outcome. So you can, you know, not smoke a cigarette every day. And like in, in your life and that reduces your risk of getting lung cancer but you hear stories all the time of people perfectly healthy people developing cancer and then people are just so perplexed and like i did everything right but i think that's that's the problem with risk it's not like compatible with you know the the, the way that we we form beliefs and like you know okay we we say to ourselves i'm gonna do this because it'll lead me to this outcome and when it doesn't you think maybe i did something wrong so i mean yeah i think it's I think the the easy thing to do, which was what we saw, was to try and create persuasive persuasive messages mm -hmm. about COVID nineteen, about the risks to inc basically just to increase the salience of COVID nineteen. Yeah. And you know, you saw this with like the simple messaging of stay home, protect the NHS, save lives. It doesn't tell you how to how? protect yourself <laughs> from COVID nineteen. It just exactly. says. Mm -hmm like for now just don't interact with anybody you don't know who has the virus and i mean if if i could wave a magic magic wand i would you know make covid19 germs visible bacteria visible i think that's probably like the the most effective thing that we could possibly do if it was ever possible like so people would look at their hands and be like okay i'm gonna go wash my hands now right mm -hmm. or or be like, oh wait, I'm gonna sanitize this desk before I leave it. It's like that visual reminder. That's, uh, that's actually a good, a good, a good question to ask you. So, um, so if you had unlimited resources, like everything, like you are the chief uh, behavioral insights person working for the government, what would be uh, the first thing that you, you know, that you would do? So you kind of have everything, like. So all resources of all power, like how would you, like what would be the first thing that you would, you would do in the to pandemic? To combat COVID? Okay. Yeah, 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 in the pandemic situation. So it, just imagine that instead of um, Boris Johnson, you are addressing the, <laughs> the British oh, public. God. <laughs> <laughs> um, God so, help the British public. Um, no, no, but, but yeah, yeah, I mean, I, what would be the, the thing that you think was necessary to do, like maybe immediately? Um, kind of, kind of I, mean, I know that it's kind of re going retrospectively, like Sarah said, it's kind of, it's easy to be smart uh, <laughs> retrospectively, but like, yeah, still, you know, you are, you are looking at this from kind of expert point of view um, because you learned a lot about behavioral science and you know what what was the uh, some probably some very simple thing to do from the start from the start i i think that i mean before i'd made any decision i would want to get a group of people in the room who actively disagreed with each other Right, because I mean, the the things that, that seemed um, obvious at the beginning were that, okay, all we know about this virus is that if people are close to each other together, breathing in the same air, you know, once we knew that it was it was airborne and things like that, then the virus is going to spread. And so, and so the gut reaction then was to be, let's close everything down, close down schools, close down workplaces. I mean, ob which obviously had huge costs and costs that i don't think that we're gonna really understand or appreciate and you know until like 10 years down the line mm -hmm. but um, the uk is doing this now right i mean that's now four weeks of, of lockdown, yeah but it's 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 a different lockdown i mm. i would say it's a it's a lockdown that really it's only really a lockdown for hospitality 
yeah. right? I mean, mm -hmm. you can still pretty much go to work. You could have like, you know, if your boiler breaks, someone comes into your house to fix your boiler, right? You're still allowed you, to go you, outside you, if you want to exercise, necessary groceries are yeah. still allowed. So to call this a lockdown yeah. would be pushing it. <laughs> well, it's, it's gyms and hospitality, uh, essentially, that have, that, that have closed. I mean, if I, I think what, what we need is to be looking forward as well. I think the, the vaccine, like when that comes around, that's going, I mean, it's getting people to get vaccinated is a huge behavioral problem. It's a big, it's a problem. A big issue, yeah. <laughs> it's a huge one. Like the, on many dimensions, like first of all, you've got to get the structural problem out the way of how do you get people to access getting the vaccine or who do you prioritize? Who's the vulnerable group? Like identifying who gets it first and how it's rolled out. Yeah, in some but countries, also, uh, I don't know, I'm sure you know, in some countries, the tests are not free. So if you go and get the ah, COVID test, ooh, you have to pay for it. That's crazy. And you have I to mean, pay a significant amount of money for it. And uh, that's normally in this developing uh, countries that, that that happens. Of course yeah. it is. I mean, and I remember like looking at the news in America of like the celebrities that, you know, paid to get a uh, COVID test so that what they can have like a, a big birthday party with all of their friends or like go to a remote island and things like that. There is definitely like structural inequality and mm -hmm. income and influence play a massive role in, you know, how you experience life in a pandemic, like who is able to pay to carry on life as normal and who is who is not so yeah i think there is a lot to say about just the structural aspects of reducing costs and reducing boundaries but also i think misinformation is a big one and i don't really know how to tackle it i mean sometimes misinformation can lead people to do the outcome that you want so for example with the flu vaccine uh it's been shown that uh, if people believe that the flu vaccine stops them from getting like, the common cold, they're more likely to get the vaccine. So, and that's not true at all, but it leads you to like the outcome, I guess, that you would want as a public health official. But there's still, it's, it's, it's not just a, behave, like a behavioral problem from like a sort of an economic standpoint. It's like a cultural, social, political problem. A lot of people don't or refuse to believe that COVID-19 is a thing that's happening or that mm. you know a thing that is serious and that it's all about coercion and, and control and I don't, I don't know maybe these people are sort of overrepresented in the media and there actually aren't too many of them but yeah it's it's a yeah conspiracy theorists and confirmation mm -hmm. bias is confirmation bias is so powerful it's very very difficult i think to convince people away from 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 their sort of uh, core beliefs especially if you if you don't if you don't believe any science, if you say every every bit of science is biased, then yeah, what is going to be able to convince you otherwise? Yeah, mm -hmm. I don't know. That that maybe didn't really answer your question. I mean, the the, the answer is I don't no, no, know. No, you answered and... the question. You said oh, lockdown, okay. lockdown, immediate lockdown. So that's that's kind of what China did, okay. which is. Uh, I mean, they did a lot of other things, but that's one thing mm -hmm. that they've done immediately, right? Um, yeah, so um, we're, we are almost at the end of, of, of the podcast, but I just have two questions for you. Um, so, uh, and I just realized that the, the next question I was going to ask sounds a, a lot like an interview question. It's like, how do you see Come yourself in the next five years? Uh, so, yeah, so I was going to ask you, what are your ideal career, career prospects and uh, how do you think data, like what role do you think data will play in, in your future work? But I mean, you can take it, um, I guess, like to sound, to, to make it sound less of an interview question. Um, you can just tell me how do you think the fields, your respective fields will develop if that's going to be easier and less, <laughs> less personal. <laughs> yeah, so, um, Merle? <laughs> um, I, I don't mind answering either version of that question because I, I've been quite transparent. I mean, we've been very transparent about our, our um, ideal career path on, on our own podcast. So it mm. would be odd if we suddenly were like, oh, you know, we're not telling. Um, <laughs> no, it's, it's just... Um, I, I've looked uh, at academia, uh, you know, like, uh, is a, a, what is that expression in English? Like I've side glanced or I side eyed academia for, for a long time now. Um, because th there are some some real structural issues within academia that I'm really not a great fan of. 
Um, I do think I'm likely to do a postdoc, but like a very industry oriented postdoc to, to just get a better taste of, uh, you know, at both worlds and then see which one I'm most compatible with. But if, if I end up staying in academia, it will be very industry focused. It will always be in collaboration with industry. In my case, industry is very likely to, to be uh, the financial sector. Uh, so, so banks or fintech apps, fintech startups, that type of stuff. That, that's really up my alleyway. Um, but then again, if there were, if there's a research unit within such a company, I, I can very easily end up there and, and, you know, cut ties with academia to the extent that I wouldn't have a, an assistant professor title or something in front of my name, which I think I'll survive. I just, uh, the, the one thing I really want to keep doing is to do research that is of uh, an academic rigor, of an academic standard. Uh, in the domain of personal finance with some type of behavioral science interaction. That's the, that's the only thing I really want from my, uh, my own career. Uh, I really want to move towards financial well-being, figure out what's going on there, really help uh, propel that field forward. With regards to, I think, how the field is developing, I think there's going to be more niches, uh, like we said. I think more people are trickling in. I hope more people will continue you to trickle in very much different backgrounds. Uh, Sarah and I have had this discussion before and where we're starting to feel like a lot of people that come into behavioral science or behavioral economics now are only trained in behavioral science or behavioral economics. Um, and the field obviously became great because it was such a mismatch of, of people with various different backgrounds. And I'm a bit worried about that moving towards just a very singular type of direction. Um, so I'm, I'm hopeful for the merger of even more fields into behavioral science, more niches, more collaborations, and uh, Sarah's favorite, more adversarial collaboration, because I know she loves that. Um, but I'm, I'm optimistic, but it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to see larger data sets. It's going to see more data. Um, mm -hmm. But at the same time, as a result of that, a larger pushback from smaller experiments from which you can properly establish causal uh, inference. I think that that's something we're going to see as a result of that as well. And I'm excited for both. The more the merrier, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, uh, Sarah? Uh, I don't know what I want to be when I grow up, Aww. is, is my answer to, to what comes next. I mean, I don't know. I think for a long time I said I would never ever stay in academia. But the more I've sort of had the opportunity to speak to people sort of five, 10, 15 years sort of ahead of me, the more mm. I, I sort of, I really like this idea of positioning between academia and, and industry and sort of involved with science communication, but also, you know, not losing that academic foothold. And I, I don't know how easy that will be, to be honest. Mm. Like if I left academia for industry, how easy it would be to come back in, um, essentially. So to be honest, uh, I have decided not to uh, worry about something I don't have to worry about at the moment. And yeah, maybe ask me in a couple of months what's going to go on, but I'll, I'll, I think I, hopefully I'll just follow, follow my, my interests. I mean, that sounds like an incredibly privileged position to be in. And I think I am incredibly privileged really uh, in that sense that I have been able to follow my interests quite freely up to this point. Um, but I, I definitely think that uh, you we we can't ignore um, the role of data and the importance of of data to the profession. And I think there's definitely one of the conversations that is being had at the moment, which I think has been inspired by uh, data and the availability and the breadth and width and quality of data now available is the ethics of applying behavioral science. And I think we still need to continue to have this conversation about, you know, uh, the, the assumptions that the paternalistic assumptions we sometimes make of assuming what we think is best for other people to do uh, and how to, you know, really innovate behavioral science. And I, I also think that we have a lot of work to do in terms of engaging and supporting and cultivating behavioral science from countries outside of the West. And uh, Mella and I spoke with uh, Nila Saldana, who mm -hmm. is uh, an, an incredible, amazing. Ac just amazing, amazing <laughs> person, academic, uh, industry titan, hybrid, and lovely as well. <laughs> uh, uh, who I think has like 
has, is doing a lot of really good work in terms of trying to establish and set up, you know, behavioral science uh, ports and labs and and collaboration, uh, you know, across different countries and cultures. And I think there is so much work to do in that regard. Like the work is is not finished at all. And no. sort of, I guess, even though we're sort of maybe reaching this point of, you could argue stagnation or trying to, I guess, uh, define or uh, uh, hone in on some sort of sense of professional identity that sort of bridges across all of these different sort of backgrounds that lead people into behavioral science. We're sort of trying to hone in on something that connects us all. While that's mm. happening in the West, I, I think that there's so much innovation going on uh, in the sort of either the, the people that would be hybrids across different fields, but also people who are doing behavioral science work applied or uh you know within academia in in not in the west and i think really we need to sort of open up a two-way dialogue rather than just having a a one-way flow of information of sort of the west onto the rest of the world about about how to innovate behavioral science i think a lot of that is to do with accessibility and i think data is going to be able to give us a lot of insight and a lot of opportunity um really to engage in those conversations but yeah, it's it needs to happen soon. I think we're we're moving in that in that direction. So if I can continue to be a part of that conversation in any shape or form, whether it's in industry or being unemployed, doing my podcast or in academia, I'll do my best to carry on doing that. Go ahead okay, and agree well, more. Well, hopefully, I mean, I'm sure I'm sure you're not going to be unemployed. Um, <laughs> In, in equilibrium i think uh, many people you know worried about employers just recently had a, a conversation with a friend of mine who lost his job just uh, like in in the midst of pandemic and he was like oh what am i going to do you know and he was a postdoc and he was like mm. what am i going to do like life is over basically and uh, i said well you know like in, you're gonna find a job like if you're gonna look for a job you can find it and he just got a professorship like full oh, nice. professorship there we go <laughs> wow <laughs> yeah wow, like in very good university and i'm like you know see <laughs> it's like yeah yeah you know so life is uh, life is life is beautiful <laughs> uh-huh. Where everything will be fine uh and if you look mm-hmm. for a job you will find it um, i mean i'm i'm convinced um you should put um, it on a t-shirt Ghana. i'm sure it will sell very well <laughs> yes i mean I'm, I'm sure it will although <laughs> you know there are, there are other, other things normally on my t-shirt <laughs> less, oh, <well. laughs> less optimistic <laughs> and more crazy mm. <laughs> okay um yeah so traditional question that i ask everyone at the end uh and this is the question everyone complains about i'm gonna ask you that question as well and the question goes like this if i asked you to recommend one book and one film what would your recommendations be it doesn't have to be a data science related it's uh, not going to be <laughs> it's something that you like something you keep going back to perhaps um yeah so who wants to go first <laughs> i don't know i can go first there i go first. go Normally reading and writing is sort of Mella's wheelhouse, but mm-hmm. I, I have read two books recently that have really left an impression on me and my soul. Um, so one of them is, I guess, uh, something, a, a book that if you're interested in behavioral science or the way that we make decisions and decision theory, you would definitely be interested in, and that's uh, Annie Duke's How to Decide. Um, I definitely think it reading that book has helped me understand a little bit more about myself as well. You sort of, it was a lot of self-revelation and uh, understanding risk and, you know, how we interpret outcomes. Um, and, and yeah, that a really, really, really good read, really accessible. Uh, and, and Annie Joke Duke has a really interesting background as a professional poker player uh, and, and uh, academic. So definitely would, recommend that one the other one that uh i guess more touched my soul was uh, it's a book by uh, angela saini called uh, superior return to race science um really about white supremacy in the production of of knowledge and science and um really about uh, open op- it really opened my eyes about you know just the way that science has been used and you know the who who does science and and our misconceptions about science and um, 
yeah, really about the intersection between science and race and structural racism. And I would definitely recommend anyone who works within academia or just has an interest in science to read it. I, it's di it's difficult to read at times as someone who is, you know, who is white because you, know, you think, oh God, I just never thought about it this way. And of course, but I think it's really important. It really, it's, it's a challenging but very, very important read. Uh, and then I guess on a lighter note, the last film that I watched that I really enjoyed was Booksmart. It was, it's a, a great movie. I guess it's like a new, a classic, I would say, in terms of the teen movie genre. Uh, it was directed by Olivia Wilde and has an amazing cast and really made me feel very happy. And yeah, so yeah, if you, if you read Superior, then watch Booksmart afterwards, sort of go back between them. And uh, you might find some sort of ha happy medium, I think, in, t yeah, in terms of how they, how they make you feel. But both good. All right. Merle? My recommendations are going to be like so much less smart sounding. I'm already worried. So um, <laughs> unlike Sarah, once, once I stop work, I, I stop work. I don't. I no longer read behavioral science books in my free time. If I'm being very, very honest, I get absolutely no enjoyment out of them. It I'm doesn't so have sorry. to be a behavioral science book. Just Excellent, book. because I'm going to recommend the entire oeuvre by Agatha Christie, because I'm a massive mystery buff, and I've read every book by her, and I would recommend every single one, so you can just pick one and have a great time. Just genuinely pick any book by her, it's fine. <laughs> great. About film... <laughs> uh, the film I've, I think I've watched the most times, uh, which I always enjoy, is The Bucket List, uh, which is just a lovely way, a completely Hollywoodified way of dealing with the terminal illness and the inevitability of death. On, I'm such that, a on, on that happy <laughs> note. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. That's, that's amazing. It's a great movie, oh. though. It's not depressing at all. Uh, right, so yeah, on, on that happy note, <laughs> thank you both for finding the time. I appreciate it. And um, I think uh, people will learn a lot from this podcast and uh, from your take on PhD. Uh, and <laughs> Very I just doubtful. Wanted, I just wanted to also direct everyone towards uh, questioning behavior podcast uh, the link will be underneath this video and um, on YouTube and also um, you can uh, enjoy Merle's uh, Money on the Mind um, uh, blog that is going strong. How old is how old is it? Is it like a couple of years now? Of uh, years? I years? think it's gonna. It's not three yet. I think. I think it's about two and a half years old now. And uh, and uh, I think today I published my three hundredth post. So go strong. Ooh. Oh, congratulations. Where, where's the applause noise? The applause yeah, noise. Yeah, <laughs> I, can, I, can, I can do that. There you go. <laughs> so yeah, going strong. Yeah, so fantastic. So thank you so much. And yeah, um, I hope I'm, I'm yeah, sure. Th thank you so much for having us. Yeah. But thanks a lot. Thanks for, for giving the, the, the youngsters a shot as well. Yes. I know our careers are not remotely as impressive as your normal <laughs> guests are. Well, I think, no, I, I didn't mean that. I just meant, yeah, I mean, there, was, there were people younger than me on the podcast, but they are not usually students, you know, they kind mm. of have this long kind of industrial list of things that they've done. And um, it's good to, it's good to hear the you know, perspective of people who are, who are doing a PhD, because that's, like you mentioned at the beginning, it's a very, very difficult journey. And the journey that you walk alone, unfortunately, despite all mm -hmm. the supervisors and, and friends and family and other people who are trying to support you and sometimes derail, derail, derail you from <laughs> the path oh, yeah. you, you've decided on. So, but yeah, I just wanted to say, don't worry too much about jobs. You will find a job if you look. <laughs> and it always happens. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we're, we're looking, don't worry. <laughs> well, yeah, for, Ghana, if you want to employ us then we're, we're yeah, very happy yeah, to accept employment for, for yeah. someone who i can tell you that until um 2013 uh in 2013 i got a job uh that so basically yeah i mean it's not 
that I mean, I, I know it sounds long, but it was not that long time ago when I got my permanent job. But before then, I had one or two year contracts. And look at me, I'm still here. So it's just, Fair you know, life. you know, it, you're a survivor. It, yeah, I mean, you will. I you wouldn't are, even say that. I mean, survivor, that sounds like you're barely getting by. Like, I know Ghana is a, like a role model for quite a few people. So to say survivor, I think is undercutting it. No, uh, don't okay, look I'll, like that, Ghana. Queen. Queen. Yeah, we, we stand a queen. We stand a queen. Well, Stand. well thank you thank you thank you for this but yeah i mean really i think i annoy uh, <laughs> just as many people as i inspire but, but but thank you so much for this and for your perspectives and um yeah uh, to those of you who are listening to us thanks a lot for listening keep thinking and uh, we'll be with you shortly with uh, new data-driven chats in a week's time so thanks a lot thanks a lot Anna. Mm -hmm. thank you